According to Jereen Grantham, that's a rather decent sign of approaching trouble. People will claim that the 21st century is uncommon, abnormal, and aberrant when their confidence in the upcoming year is so low, strange, and it has rarely been this awful throughout history. Even though the period from 2000 to the present has been abnormally excessively high profit margins, prolonged periods of high PEs, abnormally low interest rates, etc., have caused asset prices to rise, especially in housing. This is because mortgage rates, which are currently at 3%, force borrowers to pay more for their homes sooner rather than later. As a result, competition drives up prices to meet available affordability. The market wants everything to happen yesterday, but with interest rates and mortgages, it can take a while for things to filter through. However, you can be positive that it will happen if the world behaves as it has in every previous major bubble, which is all that would be required if we were in a major bubble. As of right now, mortgages are seven, and the same will happen in reverse. A 10-year smooth average price and a Schiller PE show that, well, there was a pretty decent spike in 1929 a much higher spike in 2000, and a slightly lower spike now. This is roughly the second highest point above 1929. In each case, however, the spikes filled in and returned to more average levels. Let's find other things that the market likes or dislikes and explain why the market sells high and low on a coincident basis. It turns out that the market is a coincident indicator of comfort, which is what makes the average portfolio manager feel comfortable. First, it loves low inflation, and it hates it. Even if you allow for a moderate increase in the normal Schiller, we know the market doesn't like inflation. The most significant one is that it prefers constant inflation of 2%. It dislikes inflation that fluctuates, spikes in an extreme manner, and persists for several years. Secondly, it finds large profit margins quite appealing. Surprisingly, the growth rate does not positively correlate with PE, placing the stability of growth in third place. The market dislikes plus 9 to 2, preferring plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, even though it averages high. It prefers predictability and stability. It is wary of sudden spikes in growth. The best way to describe this situation is comfort. Looking at this model, it states that 1929 should not have come as a surprise because it had low inflation, high profit margins, which were wonderful by the way, and a stable growth rate. Thank heaven, the market was called the Great Depression. Everything was negative. The trough was 6.8 times earnings, and the model predicted nearly exactly that amount. Then it makes what you might call a major error for the first time in 2000, saying that in 2000 with wonderful profit margins and no inflation, you'll have the highest PE that you have ever seen not bad directionally instead of 21 times in 1929, a new peak of 25 times, and it goes to 35 times. It got the nifty 50 exactly right. It got the idea in the 1970s that you'd be seven times earnings because terrible inflation persistent, terrible inflation, low margins, wild economic growth. We could argue that, up until that point in American history, that was the only truly bizarre psychological event. However, after 18 months, things were back on track with a setback. A housing bubble that was correctly predicted, a wipeout, and a second major deviation that began in the second half of 2021. The second half of 2021 saw a spike in inflation. Historically, these spikes have always been accompanied by PEs declining, sometimes rapidly. This one, however, was strong and created a large gap between the model's decline and the market's rise. The market then responded by saying, ah, I'm not sure I believe the Fed and the first half of 2022 was the worst six months since 1939. The model is still declining, though, because inflation is persistent. What does the model say now? It is dissatisfied with the stickiness of the inflation pattern and the profit margins, which have been declining fairly steadily in real terms for more than a year. They have decreased by more than 15% when adjusted for inflation while the model predicts 16.8, which is still quite high over the long run. However, the market is actually 29 times earnings, both on a Schiller smooth basis and on a Schiller basis. This represents a sizable gap and it indicates that if the market reacts to the same causes as it did over a 100-year period, 
Only a few years have passed since the inflation spike. So is the market truly so comfortable with inflation that it won't pause for even a moment, as it did at the beginning of 2022? Perhaps things won't go as smoothly this time around. Let's go back a few weeks to when we were all convinced that we would have a soft landing. As in 1929, 2000, and 1974. The Nifty 50, if you look at the great bubbles and nothing but the great bubbles, you'll find that the most interesting distinction is one that is specific to them and nothing else. Trust me, check the data. We were going to have a soft landing for all of these. It never works out fine. It never occurs at any other time. And that is when the market's leadership, which was up by 70 to 80% in a year, begins to decline as the blue chips keep rising. The decliners have a beta of 1.5. while blue chips have increased. Let's go back to 2021 and start with QuantumScape. We can quickly go through Kathy Wood's portfolio, meme stocks, and everything else. After Jareem's waiting for the last dance, the year was ugly and lasted until the end of December. However, this is exactly what happened in the other three bubbles as well. To put it another way, if you're forecasting a bubble, you should be stating that the hallmark of its decline will be this singular, peculiar occurrence in which the blue chip industry's final gasp will be the super leaders with the highest betas, and the bubble will burst. According to Jareem, there is a strong desire to influence these important factors, especially if one is trying to argue that the market can rise significantly. The investment business, of course, has a commercial imperative. It absolutely has to be bullish. It makes no sense to be anything else. That's how they do it every time they are bullish. So you never expect a major. Investment house to be bearish, they are risk factors. Jareem has a long history of dealing with this tendency over a few decades and he gets it. It feels good to have hope and to give things a chance. The market determines who has the most questionable price to book. Small cap and business assets have a higher chance of failing. Naturally, as opposed to big caps as a result, when you purchase them, you assume some risk in exchange for a higher quality return. However, because they have less debt, they are less susceptible to a financial catastrophe. They are sturdy. Long-standing businesses are less susceptible to economic downturns. For example, a AAA bond is expected to yield one point less than a B bond because, according to natural law, you take less risk and go bankrupt less frequently. On the other hand, AAA stocks have a history of returning 0.5% higher than the market, which is absurd given that they are the only free good and completely at odds with the early. Versions of the efficient market hypothesis whether it's 100 years, the last 10 years have been marginally better than that. And the last year has been significantly better than that. It says that by taking less risk of all kinds, less volatility, less risk of any kind, less beta, and less bankruptcy risk, you still get an extra half point a year. This makes it a strong contender for the one free lunch in the investing industry. Given that they are, let's face it, monopolies, they have excellent pricing control, strong profit margins, and a high consistent return with low debt if you fit that description. The fangs have a very high average quality. If you add that up, you'll see that while they're not necessarily better than Coca-Cola, they're pretty damn high quality when combined with growth. From 2010 to the present, the U.S. market has earned 70% more than the rest of the developed world combined. It has never done that before, and probably won't again, but for 10 or 12 years. It had this amazing 70% excess performance. If you take out the fangs, the rest of the American market performed better, perhaps by 10% or 
However, that is the margin by which they have accomplished it on a few occasions in history. The Magnificent Seven, or whatever we choose to refer to them, was the group that converted that 15% advantage into a 70% one. For a decade or two, these guys have outperformed the rest of the world by a significant margin, 70%, really, and they have some of the greatest leadership in the history of capitalism. They also enjoyed an almost endlessly favorable environment, with no monopolies, all monopolies were permitted to monopolize, and they did so to great effect. These guys are the Magnificent Seven. They're all working with completely original concepts that have never been attempted before. Nothing like Google ever fully revolutionizing the speed at which data is acquired. In fact, you'll find that the Procter & Gamble and Colgate toothpaste companies have been aggressively seeking out the smallest African country to see if it has Coca-Cola or Colgate toothpaste. The world may turn against Apple, and the mean reversion will be a slow-burning semi-political kind in which a few countries will say it is not to our long-term advantage to have this degree of monopoly over this big a chunk of our economy that would be a danger. If you look hard enough, you'll even find that Apple was even capital-intensive. It's a kind of metal basher, isn't it? They had to superimpose style, luxury, and functionality on it. They just needed to stay one step ahead of the competition in this combination. Basically, I would worry about if I were them because I've experienced terminal paralysis before. It was once said that everything looks ugly. I understand how immobilized you feel. It's not that you are unable to make decisions, rather, you must overcome the need to put together a battle plan even if it's only a rough draft that will still be better than doing nothing at these low costs. According to our data, you will essentially ensure that you do fairly well over the next seven years. We had double-digit growth on the S&P for seven years, which was a significant improvement from the previous two years. So make a plan and start investing your money. You haven't seen anything this inexpensive in 22 years. In those circumstances, you cannot invest too quickly or become overly aggressive because even if the market drops another 25% in the upcoming month, it won't affect you if you have already left the market. You are already a hero. The challenge is keeping up your hero status when real life events occur frequently. This time, however, is different as Jareem argued. The top five risky terms, nothing about this time is different. When he was debating whether or not we are in a bubble in 2016, he took the position that it isn't, but that it was, and he wasn't looking. This time is different. The traits that have been absent for the past 10 epic years were finally there in the late 2020 surge. As he repeatedly stated and wrote, bubbles emerge. It's not only about the price. If you find a price that you find uninteresting, it doesn't mean that the prices have increased. You also need to consider the irrational behavior that makes NFTS stocks stand out above the competition. Nothing compares to the magnitude of a single stock in the history of bubbles like QuantumScape. The origin of all bubbles, even greater than their stock market, is Japan real estate. The largest bubble in history, including the South Sea bubble, occurred in Japan's stock market, which reached 65 times stated earnings. Despite some cross-ownership complexity, the bubble appeared impressive. This is the mother and father of all stock bubbles. Its real estate was over 10 times that of downtown Manhattan, which was also extremely expensive. Though it's always said to believe that Fadid, who has never gotten one of these bubbles right despite the fact they have involved numerous different parties, I believe that everyone else is guilty of the common crime of expecting a gentle landing when it never comes. Fidesz underestimates the amount of time it will take for some of these issues to resolve, especially real estate. And I sympathize with that because real estate is a global bubble that has driven house prices globally to multiples of family income in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Sydney, Adelaide, and other places. The United Kingdom in London, the average family income used to be three and a half times that of Toronto, but now it is ten times higher. No one can afford to purchase a home, and no one with small children can afford to buy one. This is not a stable equilibrium. And after it peaked like everything else in the world, non-U.S. equities should be considered the aberration. As you would assume, housing has been the main driver of the 40 years of lowering rates that have driven up every asset we are discussing. However, farms and forests, 
which we are somewhat interested in, have all decreased in yield from 6% to 3%. Fine arts have all skyrocketed along with everything else, including the U.S. market. However, non-U.S. equities are oddly left behind, and he is unsure of the reason behind it. In summary, all assets should have increased due to low interest rates, which they have, with the exception of non-U.S. equities. You will have a short if you short these stocks. However, it's an exciting career because eventually one or two of them will increase six times and you will be asked for six times the money you put up and go out of business. This won't happen to the Russell, who also have the highest debt they've ever had in history, and most of the time, almost no earnings. When you push the PE, you'll get a not applicable. He believes you get it today. But the point is that if you add up all of the negatives together, even today, you'll find that the Russell 2000 has almost no earnings. If these are hard times economically, they are zombies. They will lose a lot of money in the stock market if there is a financial crisis. You don't know how these guys will respond. But the first justification is that some of them will rise back. If you don't have to go short, or if you have a portfolio like mine, you have to go short, but you never go short in individual names. If you do, you never ever go short that kind of individual name. This time is different. It's completely different, always different. First of all, Jareem agrees that, as he has already stated, the fangs are unusually remarkable, and some of the candidates for best managed new enterprises are relatively new enterprises in history. He also adds that, in every bull market of his career, People have made the argument that while it is true that the S&P's composition has changed, it is still true that doing so makes it cheaper. In the end, though, it is a very seductive and alluring argument. And do you really think it's highly unlikely that you'll be back in 20 years? Avon, Eastman, Kodak, Polaroid, and a few other companies were taken out and shot in the next 15 years and two or three other Apple-type companies will have received an unanticipated and terrible kick in the gut that some miserable countries, possibly including the U.S., have moved against them in some way. A new technology shift has rendered one or two of them completely redundant almost overnight. A new method of getting data, a new way of shuffling this, or that a new iPhone technology at one quarter, the price who wouldn't like a wonderful flipping phone for $250. The likelihood is that a few of these individuals will get shot. Shameful is the manner in which they are permitted to rampage. Although Jareem believes they should have some wiggle room, it would be shameful if they were buying up everything. Situation in each category. Each category regardless of the data. The rich and middle class feel uneasy and less wealthy than they did a year ago. Several concerns arose, including the termination of various stimulus programs, such as the reimbursement of student debt, which is a good sign of impending trouble, when there is an unusually low level of confidence among people about the upcoming year. Second, are you aware of the track record of the leading indicators? They are explosive. They are a terrific indicator that has rarely gone this bad, but the great bubbles are the only ones in which he is interested. Magnificent bubbles might take a while to form. There were no issues during the three years of the 2000 bear market, which was a mild recession. We had a three-year bear market that saw a 72% loss in the NASDAQ, a 92% decline in Amazon after it rallied wildly, and a very agonizing rebound in the housing and bond markets. You commit an error. You're experiencing the Great Depression. You commit an error. If you have a recovery like to that of the 1970s, then since Greenspan took office, the Federal Reserve has made every critical error and misjudged every assessment it made regarding a soft their combat plan has been flawed, as has the landing. Their strategy was to push the market higher in order to boost the economy. They succeeded in doing so three times in a row, but the problem is that the market always declines just when you least expect it to which has detrimental effects on the economy. Even though they are extremely silent, they actually boast about how much the economy has benefited from them. They let it grow during the 1990s and then collapse in the early 2000s. Later, they let it rise to the housing bubble and collapse with it, bringing the financial world to the verge of collapse. After that, they push it up. And here we are again with prices roughly the same as in 2000 and much higher than anything else.
In conclusion, Jeremy Grantham's last warning of a potential wipeout within 30 days is a chilling reminder of the vulnerability inherent in our global systems. Grantham, a renowned investor with a track record of predicting financial crises, has sounded the alarm on what he sees as an impending catastrophe driven by environmental degradation, resource depletion, and unsustainable economic practices. Grantham's warning is not to be taken lightly. He points to a convergence of factors, including climate change, population growth, and the relentless pursuit of economic growth at the expense of the environment as key drivers of the impending crisis. According to Grantham, these factors are pushing our planet to its limits, and without immediate action, the consequences could be catastrophic. The timeline Grantham provides, 30 days, is particularly alarming. It underscores the urgency of the situation and the need for swift and decisive action. Grantham is essentially saying that time is running out, and if we don't act now, we may not have another chance. So what can we do in the face of such a dire warning? Grantham emphasizes the importance of responsible investment as a crucial step towards mitigating the risks. This means diversifying portfolios to include sustainable assets, such as renewable energy, clean technology, and companies with strong environmental practices. By investing in these areas, we not only stand to protect our investments from the impending crisis, but also contribute to positive change by supporting businesses that are working towards a more sustainable future. Furthermore, Grantham's warning serves as a call to action for policymakers, businesses, and individuals alike. Governments must enact policies that promote sustainability and curb the carbon emissions driving climate change. Businesses must prioritize environmental responsibility and adopt sustainable practices throughout their operations and individuals must take steps to reduce their ecological footprint, whether it's through conserving energy, reducing waste, or advocating for change in their communities. Grantham's message is one of urgency and responsibility. It's a wake-up call for all of us to recognize the seriousness of the situation and take meaningful action to address it. The 30-day timeline may seem arbitrary, but it serves as a reminder that the window of opportunity is closing fast. We have a choice to ignore the warning and face the consequences, or to heed it and work towards a more sustainable and resilient future. In the end, Grantham's warning is not a prophecy of doom, but a call to arms. It's a reminder that we have the power to shape our future, for better or for worse. By acting decisively and responsibly, we can avoid the worst-case scenario and build a world that is safer, healthier, and more sustainable for generations to come. Jeremy Grantham's warning serves as a powerful reminder of the interconnectedness of our global systems and the importance of responsible investing. As investors, it's crucial to consider not only financial returns, but also the long-term sustainability of our investments. By diversifying into sustainable assets and supporting businesses with strong environmental practices, we can not only protect our portfolios, but also contribute to positive change. Remember to like, share, and subscribe for more investing tips and insights, and together, let's work towards a more sustainable and prosperous future.